socialism isn't really just something confined solely on that of the Marxist theory. Denmark and Sweden are market economies, not socialist states with planned economies. I hate this argument. It's taking the sheer dishonesty of the first argument and coming around full circle. They're taking that straw man of progressives being literal socialists, and they have the nerve to turn around and say that these countries aren't socialist when they're the ones labeling universal healthcare as socialism. This is taking empty semantic arguments to a whole nother level. Nobody is claiming that Finland is literally socialist. This really just goes to show you how intellectually desperate the right is on this issue. Socialism, by definition, could be any political or economic system involving political centralization, economic central planning, etc. And you do have parts of socialism even within the British economy, for example, and yes, a mixed economy. I do understand his point that these economies and social democrats believe in this mixed economy today, and there's nothing wrong with that. I can understand that argument, but it's wrong to say that universal healthcare it isn't socialism, that is socialism. Socialism is political centralisation and that's part of what socialism is. That's why the NHS has been abysmal failure because it's socialism and Sweden was just one of those countries, like I said, that, you know, brought in the private initiatives for the sake of that. It was actually, it was a lovely country. It was all very clean, extremely expensive though. I thought it was going to be. <laughs> yeah. Guess how much a pint was? £7.30. Oh! <laughs> but when it comes down to it, when you argue on the economic calculation problem, it completely destroys those who favour social democracies. Argument number three. Social democracies are bankrupt. Far from it. In fact, most of these countries are far more financially stable than the United States. Most of them have lower debt GDP ratios and almost all of them still have that AAA credit rating, which we lost several years ago. Well, like I've mentioned before, the serious problem with these countries is the fact that they do have a serious debt problem. There's no denying that fact. You could look at Denmark, you could look at Sweden, you could look at Norway. They have a serious debt problem, there's no denying it. Or the, that of Finland, these countries do have a serious debt problem. At the end of the day, that's because of all the reckless spending and, and wasting of such natural resources. Norway being the prime example, it tore the backside out of the North Sea oil for the past five to six decades. That's not the sign of an economy that's efficient. You see, these countries aren't as glorious as you make them out to be because in the long term, never mind the short term, but in the long term, are these countries going to sustain that? Is Norway going to sustain the higher tax rates in the big welfare state? No, it's not. Because it's going to have to find some way in order to be productive to get the money coming into their country. And the North Sea oil is not going to last them forever and they recently had divested away from North Sea oil. Argument number four. What about Greece, Italy, Spain, and Portugal? These countries really are fiscally irresponsible and riddled with corruption. But not only are they in the minority of social democracies, but it's not entirely their fault that they're in trouble. It's the European Union's fault for imposing austerity and tight money policies. So honestly, it's right-wing policies that are being imposed on them, like austerity. Greece has thousands of years of history and is arguably a country with the worst credit rating in world history. It's a long history of socialism. And that's why Greece is in the mess that it's in today. So is Portugal. So is Spain. And why are they in that mess? Socialism. Because they're profligate. Because they don't know how to live within their means. Because they don't understand the value of capitalism. Yes, today they have these mixed economies. We have the private sector and they try to mix it with this of socialism. But how are you supposed to run a mixed economy? How are you supposed to run an economy with businesses and higher tax rates? And then expect good results at the end of that? Where smaller business people struggle and it ends up creating monopolies in the hands of giant corporations. Because that precisely defines what the European Union really is. And even if these countries were independent from the European Union, they would still be rife with corporatism, which is their own undoing. How are you supposed to have an economy that prospers off the back of that? The social democracies that you're speaking of, such as that of you know, these countries, you're calling out for the strong government regulation, as I said. The social market economies, 
have extremely low levels of government regulation, so they're able to sustain themselves to some degree. You're not calling out for that, however. You want to strongly regulate the private sector. You basically want to do a Scottish National Party. You want to do an SNP. Argument number five. You may get a lot from the government, but have fun paying those taxes. If you are lower or middle income, you'll get more from the government than you'll pay in taxes. And even if you're upper income, you'll have a solid safety net in case something happens to you. Now, as I said in the Freedom Tunes video, it's good for the rich to pay higher taxes since their income is more disposable. And by the way, the US spends much, much more per capita on healthcare and education than Europeans do. So if you include the costs of private premiums and tuition, then you're much better off paying the taxes. So I don't need to go into this argument too much because I've covered basically the issue with the severe lack of productivity. But in relation to that, and what I will add, is the fact that many of the smaller business people are struggling, and many of them end up going under as a result of the higher tax rates. This ends up, you know, preventing many other people who would love to start up their own small business. It prevents them from ever doing so. This all goes down to the argument that, yes, government creates jobs, but it destroys far more jobs than what it creates. Government is not a job creator. The job creator is the private sector. And if you're going to strangle the private sector half to death, whether it's the strong government regulation, which is what these social democrats would call out for, or of course the higher tax rates, then of course they're going to be crippled. And it's not better off for the poor. Because what does the private sector do? It basically passes off the higher tax rates off onto the taxpayer. In other words, what businesses do in order to compensate for the higher taxes, they raise their costs of goods and services. Or they pay off the workers so that there's basically fewer workers and they might replace them with automation. Argument number six. None of the Scandinavian countries have minimum wage laws or burdensome regulations, so they're more in line with laissez-faire free market capitalism. This is extremely misleading. They may not have an official minimum wage, but their unions are so well backed by the government that their effective minimum wages through collective bargaining are sometimes even higher than Bernie's goal of $15 an hour. Anyone who works in these countries makes a living wage. In fact, it, this is more progressive than just having a set minimum wage. And as for regulations, as you've probably heard me say, it depends on the regulation itself. It's true that these countries have fewer unnecessary regulations, but they're very strict when it comes to regulations that protect workers, consumers, and the environment. For the purpose of this argument, and I've already argued on the unemployment of these Scandinavian countries like that of Denmark, changing it slightly, if you were to talk about the minimum wage, you can check out the video where I explained in detail about the minimum wage. Because when you raise the price of the lower skilled workers, they're no longer in demand um, from the employers. You end up getting paid off, you end up seeing, again, business owners compensating for that, so they'll raise the cost. Who does the cost get passed off onto? Always gets passed off onto the taxpayer or that of the people who are the consumers at the end of the day. They, well, they would be taxpayers. Argument number seven. If these countries are so prosperous and happy, then why do they have such high suicide rates? This is, there is absolutely no correlation between a country's level of prosperity and their suicide rate. In fact, these are the countries with the lowest suicide rates, so by your logic, we should aspire to be like Pakistan, Egypt, Syria, and Venezuela. By the way, uh, here's a comparison between our suicide rate and the Scandinavian rates. Well, the argument really hasn't been debunked because if you were to look at the United States of America, then yes, it's been in a severe economic mess. And because of the strong government regulation over the private sector, one would only need to stare at that of the medical care costs in America that soared out of control and for many years they've been faced with that of a serious unemployment problem. I think Baltimore is a place that's got serious problems. Even Detroit and now you look at California it's going in the same direction. All these places that are ending up in a severe economic mess because of all the socialism. Now that's not to say all states are the same but collectively the United States is strongly corporatist. It's no wonder it's got a serious problem. Argument number eight. Until the recent tax cuts all of these countries had lower corporate tax rates than the US. Extremely misleading. If you adjust for loopholes and deductions then before the Trump cuts our effective corporate tax rate was a measly 14 percent and now it's even lower. Okay I cannot touch upon the argument to do with the United States because I don't know anything of recent. I think there was a reduction in taxation, but 
that's not looking at things as a whole. Because then if you were to compare the Scandinavian e economies, they're sitting with extremely low levels of government regulation, so their economies are fed faring better off because of strong economic business freedom. That's the complete opposite to that of the United States of America, where they have a serious problem where they strongly regulate the private sector, and it's why it's been faced with such a problem over so many years. Argument number nine. Okay, so maybe social democracy works in countries like Denmark, but their population is like 5.7 million. You can't expect that to work here, too. I've heard lots and lots of people make this argument, but none of them have ever been able to back it up. If you were someone who makes this argument, I want you to leave a comment explaining why, in detail, their population matters, as specifically as you can. Like... Sure, there are some cases where population matters, but this is not one of them. I've heard people argue that fewer people means less spending, but it also means less revenue, so what's your point? And more importantly, where is your completely arbitrary dividing line? Canada's population is 37 million, South Korea's population is 51 million, the UK's population is 66 million, France's population is 67 million, Germany's population is 83 million, and Japan's population is 127 million. The US has 327 million people. But that's only four times the population of Germany, while well, Germany's population is 15 times Denmark's population. The ratio disparity between Denmark and Germany is four times that between the US and Germany. And by the way, if you are just dead convinced that we simply have too many people to have a social democracy, then we can find a way for the states to do it. California is by far our largest state, and its population is less than half the population of Germany. These countries are not successful, because economic success would be measured down to that of, not just to do with the material wealth, the living conditions, and so many things that you would measure, it would come down to efficiency. After all, why does the study of economics exist? It exists because resources are not infinite, because resources are finite. It's all about a question of our place on this earth with scarce natural resources and how we can better improve the material standards of living of the masses whilst using the fewest resources as possible. Because after all, if resources were infinite, you wouldn't need the study of economics because there's no need to economise, is there? Now, if you were to contrast Denmark to that of Hong Kong, Hong Kong had practically no natural resources. It was getting richer each and every single year because of the strong free market economy. <laughs> Unbelievable. Because if you were to contrast the average poor person of the 1950s in Hong Kong to the average poor person of Hong Kong today, there's a massive difference. Hong Kong was able to lift the masses out of poverty. It made the rich richer and the poor richer. Now, if you were to contrast that to Denmark or any other Scandinavian economy that has literally tore the backside out of natural resources, and has been faced with severe lack of productivity in its domestic economy, and is sitting with a debt problem, and has a serious problem where they cannot afford to produce in their own home countries. How on earth can anybody in the right mind call that economically successful? <laughs> it makes no rational sense.